Hi everyone, this is Mihaela with Hey Stella Podcast, episode 60. <sighs> I have just uh, returned from the trip in Egypt and the last episode 59 was on my first part of being in Egypt. And it was the part before I started to teach the acting workshops with the Egyptian actors, artists in Cairo. What I realized was that no matter if I teach here in New York, no matter if I teach in Egypt, no matter if I teach in Romania, no matter what countries I've been to, discussions to what they have not been trained to work on is the same. First of all, I had such an extraordinary time. I think the actors, the artists, open mind when it comes to soaking in and being available to take on or to listen or to try to understand new techniques, new methods, method acting. Their openness to say, yes, I'm curious to know what you have to share with us is so extraordinary. And the ones who are in the beginning of their career and some of the ones who are already in the middle of their career are so much more open-minded than the ones who are somewhere at the top of their career. I am realizing more and more that those actors who are already working a lot in their respective countries, they're much more close-minded when it comes to accepting or even taking the time to be curious and say, we have this woman who's coming to share method acting from New York, who's a lifetime member of the actor studio. So she's bringing it from the source where I have been trained, where I've had the privilege to work on the stage to try this technique, this method technique. You would think that when you have the opportunity to go in and see what this work is about. And then you, as an adult, you can make the decision afterwards to say, you know what? I think I'm going to take some of the things that she has to say, but then I'm not going to take the other things that she has to say. This seems to be something that might help me to become a more detailed actor. And the other things that she says do not help me at all. The most famous actors do not want to be open or even be curious to attend such workshops. And it blows my mind because it happens in every country that I've been to. But the younger ones are just soaking it up. They're so available. They're so kind. They're so precious. They're so ready to ask questions. They're so ready to be open to new techniques. The first part of Egypt's festival for which I was invited to go and do a workshop and teach acting was about all of us who were invited from so many countries to go and watch about two or three shows during the evening from different countries. There were countries like Oman who had performance. There were countries such as Mexico, France, Belgium, Tunisia, Morocco, and so many others that I can't even remember because there were so many shows. And those shows were presented with already finished performances, productions, plays. For me, watching them again, all of them being from different countries, all of them having different cultures, all of them having different traditions, they're all facing the same acting problems. They're not paying attention to the specific way of working, which is to make your character the most credible to the audiences, to make your character a human being who is not an actor acting, but who is a character that's a human being living actively on the stage. So the focus today is going to be on the monologues, monologues for actors in these performances when they're not speaking to another person on stage, 
tend to be done in a very general way. What do I mean by that? They consider the monologue to be a monologue. They know as actors that they have a paragraph or they have half a page where they are speaking without interruptions from the other characters. Because they know that, they don't dig deeper into it to realize that a monologue is only a monologue for the person who wrote it. A monologue is only a monologue for the writer. When the actor comes on to try to interpret that monologue, to try to find the justification to why he's speaking on his own or on her own for half a page, there's no questions about it. In their mind, they remain actors who have a monologue, knowing that there's not going to be an interruption from the other character before they say the last line of the monologue. And I'm here to say that a monologue for actors is never a monologue. For actors, a monologue is always a scene. Monologues for actors are always scenes. What do you mean they're scenes when it is written in the script or in the play that I am talking to myself? I don't have the other character have a dialogue during my monologue. How could it be a scene? What I mean by that is as the actor. Yes, I'm coming on a stage in this case of the International Festival in Cairo. You know, as the actor, you are aware of the reality of what is. I am the actor. I am coming on stage. And for the beginning moment, I don't have another actor on stage with me because I have a monologue. That tells me that the training that they have has not been pointing to the specific way of trying to go and analyze that monologue. First of all, you have to discover why, what is your objective? What are you trying to get by speaking alone for half an hour? There's got to be a reason for it. The writer wrote that for the character has a reason. What do you hope to obtain? What is your objective? in speaking to no one and you don't have anybody else on stage with you. All of those questions have to be asked, even if you don't know the answers and even if you don't know the exact answer, but you must have the question. Why in what situation would I speak to myself? So you can give yourself, the actor, a motive that's going to make you be active, that's going to make you want to live on the stage. So when you're coming out as an actor on the stage and we see you coming as an actor, it's because your acting is general. You're not asking all these questions. I'm saying this from my observations of watching all these performers during so many nights. And again, performers from different ages, different level of their career, different countries, they all are lacking that understanding. It doesn't mean that they are not good actors. It means that they haven't been trained. It is very surprising to me how I keep finding out that this method acting, this acting method, it changed acting forever globally, beginning with the actor studio stage and people like Marlon Brando is not known worldwide. So I'm sitting there and I'm excited to be in Cairo, beautiful, enthusiastic to begin my workshop. As I always am when I work, I'm one of those people who doesn't know what to do with herself when I don't have work. So for the first couple of days before the workshop began, for those days, I just felt so overwhelmed with everything. And that's in my latest in the previous episode where I talk about it. But as soon as I got to start to work with those incredible, beautiful artists, actors in the workshop, everything switched. Because if I don't work, if I don't do that, which is teaching, sharing, which I love so much, I feel like I don't have food for the soul. And I think it was Anton Chekhov who said, work, work, work is what keeps us sane. So that's how I 
feel. I feel that if I have days that I'm not working, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm out of my body. I'm in my body. I'm moving around. I feel like I'm completely lost. So as soon as I started the workshop with those amazing students, everything shifted. I felt so much more satisfied and worthy of being able to share something with them, having watched them receive and wonder and be curious and ask questions about all of these things that we're talking about. Because the workshop was only about a few days long. We did not get to do scene work, but we did get to work on their monologues. Majority of them did not speak English, so we had a translator. She was wonderful. And what I came to realize, as I did so many other times in other countries, is that if the actor is questioning all of those things that I spoke about earlier, I don't even have to have translated what the monologue is about because I can understand from their specific behavior, from their detailed living actively on that stage, what is going on. I don't have to have the translator tell me what they are saying because the language doesn't matter. That is the power of acting. The power of acting provides a universal language, which is the language of human behavior, which is the same with small traditional changes, with small cultural changes. But credible behavior of a human being is the same anywhere. So we started to work on the monologues and I gave them the first choice to do the monologue the way they would do it. I asked them to bring a monologue that they were familiar with, something that they had worked on. And it was the same thing that I expected. They come on stage. They don't even come on stage. They start center stage. So they place themselves ready to do a monologue center stage as actors without giving themselves the moment before, which is another important practical, concrete moment that you as the actor must create for yourself, even if it's not given in the script, you have to come up with something depending on what the monologue is, depending on what you want to transmit with a monologue, depending on what the objective is and why it is of such huge importance that you speak those words, you must come from something from a moment before. The moment immediately before you start the monologue. Even if you're not going to present that moment to the public, to the audience, you have to do it in practice on your feet backstage before you come on. What would be such a moment? For example, there was a wonderful uh, actor who actually traveled from Alexandria to come to Cairo because a few years ago when I was doing a workshop in Alexandria, he heard of it and he wasn't able to attend. So now he traveled from Alexandria to Cairo and there was another beautiful actress who came. There were a couple of them who actually came from Alexandria to take the workshop. And that's what I mean about their 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 hunger to learn and their hunger to, to be open to new possibilities and understand more how they can improve themselves as actors and maintain being great show after show after show. So he came on stage in the classroom, which I like to call a stage, and he started the same way, which I had just mentioned to you, which was he placed himself center stage and he started speaking. I let him go on for one or two minutes and then I stopped because I realized that he came on with a general interpretation, a general idea of what the monologue was. I did not even have to know about what he was talking about because I already could tell from the behavior that it was not a human behavior, but it was an actor's behavior. So you could see that he's an actor on stage performing a monologue, which is not what the audience needs to see. The audience needs to forget that that person is an actor. He needs to become a human being who's living in that moment actively on that stage. So I stopped him and I asked him just a little bit about what he was trying to do, what he was working on. What did you work on? A question that they have never been asked because I believe the directors are not able 
to understand the process of the actors in order for them to be able to go into specifics and to ask these questions of the actors. So it's not just the actors who don't understand this detailed process of training and of giving themselves that credible beginning place to have a reason to why I'm saying the first line of the monologue. And he gave me a little bit of a synopsis, the first thing that he said, oh, it is a sad monologue. When somebody says it is a sad monologue, you have to say, okay, you're saying it's a sad monologue. Because maybe in working with his director prior to this workshop, that's what bad directors and majority of directors everywhere tend to do. They give actors an emotional genre that they want the actors to be in when that should be the furthest away from what they should be discussing with the actors because if you think about it if I'm telling you in everyday life I want you to speak for half an hour without me interrupting and I want you to be sad because I believe that you should be sad in this situation what does that mean that doesn't mean anything that doesn't give anybody a foundation that they can stand on and feel grounded to allow that monologue to become colored with sadness in the beginning, maybe. You never know until you try to decipher it. You never know until you make it credible for yourself as a human being. You never know until you have tried backstage the moment before to know how you're coming in. When you are asking an actor as a director to be sad because that's your understanding because the words give you that understanding. That's such an obvious choice. If I'm sad and if I've gone through a difficult day and I want to reveal that in words, I don't come to you and, oh, I've had a difficult day. I'm sad. Maybe I'll do that in one instance. But in another instance, on a different day, maybe the sadness has lifted and I will still say, I'm sad, I've had a horrible day, but I would be coming in with joy, I had a horrible day. I'm sad because my subtext and what I'm living inside is that I have passed that moment. So now, even though I'm using the same words in the script, I am making the choice to go against the obvious of what the words tell me. The most important thing is to find the motivation and the justification to why you want to interpret and to have choices as an actor that are not obvious to the lines. Because if you're interpreting a material as to what the lines are telling you and you say, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I am furious. If you do that, you're going to tell the audience what they already know from having just read the play or the script. Why would they need you as the actors to come and interpret what those words are if you're going to interpret them as they are written? That doesn't make any sense. Those are not bold choices. Those are not risky choices. You're staying with the safety of, oh, but this says that I'm sad. Therefore, I have to put on my sad face. The complexity of our humanity doesn't work like that. We don't have just one thought and one feeling and one emotion happening. And then the next one comes in and then there's a compartment and then the next one comes in and everything is linear and organized. No, most of the times, even now when I'm speaking to you, I don't have just one thought. I don't have just one feeling. I have a multiple, I have multiple feelings. I have multiple emotions. I have thoughts that are going in my head saying to me, how are you explaining this in a way that people are going to be clear about what you're saying? There's doubt in myself right now thinking, am I saying too much? Will I confuse them even more? There's all these things that are going underneath the words that I'm actually speaking to you because right now I'm doing a monologue. I don't have anybody that I'm speaking to, but I do. I know that there's going to be an audience who might be watching this episode of Hey Stella Podcast or someone who might go to my YouTube channel. I don't know particularly who the audience is, but I am aware that I'm not speaking to myself. I'm not speaking to myself. 
I know that there's nobody coming in to cut me off in the middle of this conversation. But if I give myself that opportunity to make that choice and to say, even though a monologue is about speaking by myself without interruptions, what if I add on the choice, which is not obvious to the text, to say, what if I get a comment? What if this was live as the plays are live on stage? And what if I get somebody from the audience who's moving in their chair? What does that say about that audience member? That says about the audience member that he or she might not be enjoying what I'm saying as much. They're getting bored. I have to allow myself to register that movement, that shift in the chair. And even though the theater where the audience is, is dark, I can try, I can try to search, taking into consideration that there is darkness and not pretend that I can see them because if there's darkness over the audience, I'm not going to be able to see. But the fact that I'm trying to see who that person is, because maybe the way that I continue my monologue is going to change the tactic in which I try to give the message, having the information that somebody might be bored is going to change. And me as the character on the stage is going to maybe pay particular attention to that one member in the audience and the subtext would be, I see you, just give me another moment and you will see what I mean. Stay with me. I appreciate you being here. I get it that you're shifting in the seat. I don't know the reasons you have. You might be just tired from having a long day of work, but I promise you that I'm going to give you the message if you just give me one minute. Yes. So maybe my voice is going to raise to use the same words that I was talking about before. I've had a very difficult day. I've had a very difficult day. I understand. So the way that my line is going to be said is going to be, I understand that you also may have had a difficult day. So you're trying to make connection, particular connection with a member of the audience. That you're still trying to see because that's why the audiences go to watch performers. They go because they want you to be as human as they are everyday life where they have to put the facade we all have to put the facade on in different environments because we have to respect society rules which there's nothing wrong with so when they come into the theater they want to be recognized even if you're not calling them by name even if you're not saying oh you're sitting in that chair I see you but with your text you just have to change the emphasis on what words you are placing the emphasis on to make it seem like you are talking to them so when you're taking the audience in you can't just take a general audience in and to look in the darkness and you pretend that you I've had a sad day I have had a difficult day, therefore I'm sad. And you're just looking at the whole audience because your connection is not going to be as strong. The person is not going to see you be detailed on stage, taken into consideration what is obvious, which is I'm not going to pretend that I see everybody in the audience because I can't unless the lights are on them. But in most cases, the audience is in the dark. So when you're looking at the audience and you're pretending that you're seeing all of them and you're looking at them and you're pretending that you don't have to struggle to see them, you don't have to look for them like this or go behind where the light is or go above the light or try to see the figure, the shape. When you're not giving yourself that additional detail to make that connection with the audience visible to them, they're not going to believe you because you're doing general acting. You're not living actively. There's general acting and there's living actively on the stage. And it's going to help you. If you give yourself that permission to be detailed about your behavior by giving yourself that detailed 
work, giving yourselves when on stage the obstacles of in this situation, I'm trying to make contact with one person. I'm trying to see how hard is it going to be for me to distinguish a shape. Maybe it's going to be in the first row. Maybe it's going to be in the fifth. Maybe it's going to be all the way in the back. And I have to get up, right? I have to get up to see them. That additional work to overcome that obstacle of the darkness and to make sure that you're trying for real to establish a shape of one audience member is actually going to give you the active ignition from which you can continue with the monologue. So it's not a recital that's going to stay a said monologue. It's depending on your reaction, depending on the reaction and your sensibility and your use of the senses to hear that somebody was shifting, to hear that somebody maybe is talking to another person and you are trying to get their attention because you have something that's important that you have to say, they are actually helping you if you allow them in, if you don't pretend that you're not hearing them, they are actually gonna give you the way in which you can continue with the monologue in order to achieve. I want you to pay attention because this in some way, having had experiences in my life more than you do because I'm older as the character, let's say, maybe my sharing, it will make your life a little bit easier. So I know you're shifting. I know you're talking to the other person next to you, but just give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. And I guarantee, or I hope that you will take something away from this when you go home after the performance. So it's a give and take, give and take. The audience, when paid attention to, becomes your partner, becomes your other actor. And it influences the way that you go about your monologue. And it gives your monologue colors. It gives your monologue sadness, it gives your monologue joy, it gives your monologue anger, it gives your monologue peacefulness within a half a page, depending on what you allow yourself to react to and depending on how much you give yourself permission to actually allow the audience to influence that. But if you just come on stage and you are completely neutral because you know you have to do a monologue and there's the audience and you're looking around like this and you're saying words, then you don't have anywhere to go with it. You don't have an objective because you have nothing that you're trying to achieve. You're not trying to achieve to convince that person not to leave, convince that person not to talk with the other person because you have something to say. And you're actually taken away from the character. You're taken away from the complexity of the character because you're bringing the character to your acting in one note. And it's not fair to the characters that you play. You have to rise up to them. You have to give them all the notes because in everyday life, we have a lot of notes that we play all the time. We don't play them as much because of restrictions and because of politeness, but on the stage, on a set, in a movie, we are allowed to play all the notes because you have to remember a two hour movie or a two hour play is the only life that the audience gets to see of the character. So in those two hours, you have to put all of yourself, all of the character's backstory. They have to see all of the character's in-between scenes story. They have to see all of you as if they followed you through your entire life because they want to get to know you. So you have to be more heightened in the way that you are behaving. There's no bold or big or too much or overacting if you are actually being specific and detailed in the way that you go about it. And you allow yourself not to just be an actor who appears center stage and says a monologue that the director told you was a sad monologue. Because then what's the point? I might as well stay at home and read the play. Why would I want to go see it? Interpreted by somebody who's just a reader, who's reciting what I could recite by myself at home. I can even recite it better at home and I could make it even more imaginative for myself 
than to watch somebody be one no. So to see this one person that I'm talking about, this amazing actor, Mustafa, Mustafa from Alexandria, tell me a little bit about the fact that his monologue was about a painter. He's drawing a painting and then he's having a difficult time appreciating the painting. So he's feeling badly about the fact that he's not painting it better. He's feeling that he's not good enough as an artist, as a painter. So he starts the monologue and in his hand, he has a paintbrush. He starts the monologue. So he thinks that the monologue has to be said because that's probably the interpretation that is the first interpretation that he got from reading it. So he comes on stage, center stage. He has a paintbrush. And from the beginning, he's playing a general feeling of sadness, of anger. He's breaking the brush. He's saying the monologue. He remains center stage one note for the two minutes monologue. So I stopped and I said, why am I stopping? Why do you think I'm stopping? Why do you think I'm stopping? You have to ask the questions. They have to come up with remembering that there are questions to be asked. And I said, why were you doing the monologue being sad? And he responded, well, the monologue is sad because this character is very dissatisfied with his work. He's not able to get the painting ready. And I said, okay, Let's just go to the moment before the thing that we're talking about. What is the moment before you come on? Because right now you're saying the monologue. I don't see a painting in the room. I don't see you taking the space in. That's another thing. The space. Where are you? You're not an actor on stage. Yes, you are in the first awareness in your mind. But then where are you as the character? How do you make that place personal and specific to you that will give you what you need to put fire under you to start the monologue. Actors, they come on stage as actors. This character that he was portraying was not an actor. He was a painter. So why are you coming on stage as an actor doing a monologue and ripping, breaking a paintbrush? Let's work on the moment before. What do you mean? Let's work on the moment before to create what the space is. What is the space? This is my home. Okay, tell me, using your senses, using your sight, I want you to visualize where your artwork is. Do you have any other artwork? Do you have any other paintings? Yes. Can you show them where they are on the walls? He had to all of a sudden become active. He had all of a sudden to live actively which took him, the actor, from center stage and allowed him to move as a human being around the place, even turning the back to the audience, looking to see where his paintings that he had painted before are. Only doing that physical turning puts the audience mind at ease because they are starting to see a human being moving about in a place not on stage where they're always facing the audience and it becomes a place that is more than a stage for them therefore for the audience that's when we start to believe that what he is doing show me the painting I said show me one of the paintings Using the sense of touch, after you visualize it, you first see it, where on the wall is it? I want you to draw with your hand and touch the frame of it so you can let me know how big this particular canvas is, the one that you are now having a difficult time finishing because the inspiration, because inspiration has left you. So as soon as he turns with the back to the audience and he's framing, he's outlining with his hand, the painting, it doesn't mean that you have to do it for 10 minutes. You do it for a moment just to create that real for you. Because if you make it real, if you believe that there is a painting as the character, as the actor, by giving yourself that work that you must do, which is outline with your hand in one second, the audience is going to believe it. You don't have to worry about the audience and making them believe. You have to worry about believing yourself. And in order to believe yourself, you have to do. You have to actively 
continue on creating personal place, personal objects, imaginary, but to you real, to give yourself that reality. As soon as he turned like this, and he was outlining the painting, he took his brush, which was a pen, but the way that he was holding it, I believe that it was a brush. And I said, go on and work and try to finish it, finish painting it, even though you have no inspiration. Before you start the monologue, let us see what the moment before is. Now using the space that is personal to you, it's not just the stage, you've turned it back to the audience. So he gets up and he turns and he starts to specifically, specifically, he was so specifically, he became so particular with the brush and where he was holding it and how much space you leave between your fingers that the paintbrush takes. When somebody holds a brush like this, it means they are holding nothing. That's not being specific. So leaving yourself space to feel the paintbrush in it in between your fingers and feeling what is it made of wood? What is it made of? How long is it? And he started detailing. He started going like very specifically and detailing on this imaginary painting. But that became a real painting to him, therefore to us watching. So he does that for about a minute. And then without me even giving him anything, because he already had a starting point that was already real and credible for himself, he takes the brush and he turns it. And with the end of it, he starts scratching. He starts scratching it, 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 because he doesn't like it because it's not what he wanted with it because he's lost his creativity as the character for the moment and he knows his work is not good and he can't get back to the work being good so he scratches it we see the imaginary painting being destroyed and all of us were moving back in our seats because it became so real because it became real for him so when he went to the first line he went to the first line of the monologue without having turned towards us from where he was and he was destroying the painting. He then went to the first line to express, as most of us do in real life, our frustration with something, our feeling of unworthiness, our feeling of I'm not good enough. I can't even do this. I'm not great as a painter and this is my life and this is my art. So by the time that he started the monologue, he was a completely different person. So when he moved away from it, because now the imaginary painting was falling down and he was looking at it. And then he took the brush and he ripped it and he threw it. And he slowly was sliding off of the same wall that the painting was on before and he ended up on the floor lying down on his back crying there were so many different emotions there was so much reality that was infused in that one simple monologue of two minutes and it wasn't sadness it was everything else but sadness from beginning to the end. It was exciting. It was active. It was humane. It was emotional in different ways. The other thing that he was able to do, he was able to surprise himself. He was able to surprise himself from moment to moment to moment. Then the actor, knowing the monologue, was gone because the character doesn't know the monologue. The character became alive when the actor's trying to create reality and behavior on stage, plus what the script is giving you. When the actor is trying to create a reality plus the merging of the given circumstances is what creates great behavior, is what creates great acting. Everybody was taken by surprise, 
because he was taken by surprise. Physically, the whole map of what he was thinking it was going to be from the previous way of doing it, which was static center stage, to what happened now, which was human behavior, all of these emotions and all of this frustration and all of this doubt about himself, his art, which is his life, what he said, that was his life that he just destroyed because he didn't feel that he was able to live it fully, to do the painting, to do it justice. And that crushed him. So when he crushed him, it doesn't just crush you from here, here, standing and doing a monologue. It crushes you emotionally, it crushes you mentally, it crushes you physically. That's why he dropped, he dropped, he dropped. He was laying on the floor with tears in his eyes. Finished the monologue, we just stood in silence because we did not think it was done. Even though we knew that it was about two minutes. So the first time we knew when it was done because, okay, the monologue, center stage, blah, blah, blah. We didn't even care that it was done. We were just watching him falling apart as the character because we can relate to that because who hasn't fallen apart as a human being in everyday life? So we identified with his his passion. We identify with him not being able to do justice to his art, which means that he's not doing justice to his life. Who doesn't identify with that? You don't have to be an artist to identify with that. So we believed everything. We stayed in that silence and he stayed in that and he stayed in that. And it was the first time again where the monologue was finished and he didn't say, okay, the monologue's finished. He couldn't even say anything because he was still living. Even though there were no more words, the monologue was finished, but he was still living. He was still living it. So it took another minute before he actually was able to get up. Before he was actually ready to get up, he couldn't even say it's done. Then he felt so good and he felt so filled with truth. He felt so great because he gave himself permission to not be an actor in a monologue, but he was able to put the actor's struggle, use the imaginary object by creating it with the sense of touch and the sense of sight, which gave him a physicality that incorporated his entire being, not just his mouth and his face from the neck up. And then he lived it in the moment for the first time in a way that was true behavior. He was actively living. He wasn't acting. He was living actively. It was beautiful. I mean, all of them were just superb. They were just so superb. But it goes to show you that every time somebody would get up, we would have to go back to the same questions. Questions that you want to have when doing a monologue. If you don't train, if you don't give yourself 15 minutes every day to work sensorially, to train your imagination, as Alan Burstyn says, we have to work sensorially. We have to do exercises to train our imagination the same way that a marathon runner has to train his body and mind and all the time. He can't just wait until the marathon to train and then run the 20-mile marathon or a 10-mile, whatever. You have to train ongoingly for the entire life as an actor. And that's something that's not known. So the two examples that I gave you, the first one, when I said, okay, you make use of the audience and you specifically look to see how you are going to convince one person or two people from the audience or maybe the entire audience, but use the reality of what is to begin with of not seeing them. So create that task for yourself to try to see at least one. That's when you talk to the audience and that's when you are engaging the audience as if they were your other character or other characters, but they just don't happen to be on stage. The second one with the painting was when the fourth wall, you're using the imaginary wall, which a lot of people don't do. A lot of actors, again, they let it be a general looking around or not looking around which was the first try about the painting. The way that he did it the first time by being center stage, he was just talking to himself. Like, who are you talking to? I'm talking to myself. But if you're just sitting, standing in a position of an actor doing a monologue saying that you're talking to yourself, I don't believe that you're talking to yourself. Because if I talk to myself, if I'm deciding that I'm not going to use the audience, so I'm by myself in a room, 
I'm not just going to stand in the middle of my living room and talk to myself. That's not the way talking to yourself is. The way you talk to yourself is because of something of an active, something that you did, in his case, the frustration with not being able to finish the painting. And then, of course, you talk to yourself. And you talk to yourself in, in, in the way that you're creating the space. The space informs you, the imaginary object the painting informs you what does that mean what is the gravity of you not being able to continue with your art what would it be for me if I could not teach which is going back to what I said teaching makes me feel whole as a person it gives me satisfaction it makes me it makes me it makes me feel like I'm doing something for someone hopefully so if somebody took that away from me and I had to react to that in the privacy of my home. Do you think I'd be sitting or just standing? Maybe that's an option, but I would have to rehearse. I would have to rehearse that if I were a character who has lost that passion because somebody took it away. The consequences are grave. Using the fourth wall, as in the painting exercise with the painter, or using the audience, which is you're not using the fourth wall, the imaginary wall. You're trying to create a report you're trying to create a connection with them by paying attention to what's happening the moment before they come on stage another thing that I was witnessing which was very general and I just don't understand how that's not something that's being implemented more and more so you come on stage and you have two actors on stage already stage left stage right the one actor stage left he has a monologue of a couple of lines and the other actor is doing something else when there's no written dialogue between the two actors, they don't look at each other. There was one instance in one of the shows where there was a conflict between two characters on stage and they were looking at each other when they had one line and then one line because they consider that to be a dialogue. So it's obvious to the text. What are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. And then goes away from the other character and releases his frustration about what the conversation was. So it's as if I have my other actor who's right there next to me. And I'm like, what happened with this? Why was this dropped? I told you the meaning of the subject. Why are you dropping it on the floor? And the other character says to me, I don't care about your object. I don't care. Take it away from here. It, it, it comes into my space and I don't want to take it away. And then there's a moment where I go and I'm like, I cannot believe this is happening to me. I cannot believe that I keep talking to you about the same thing, but I'm not talking to the character. So I'm just kind of leaving that back and forth where I'm making eye contact. I'm turning away. By turning away, you have to create a circle of lights around yourself to allow yourself to become private, but still be knowledgeable and still be aware that there's another person on stage. So you can still talk to yourself and not look at the other person and go, this conversation has been taking place so many times. And why do I keep doing this? Why do I put myself in this situation? Why do I have, you know what? Why am I taking on the same tryings with you when I get the same answers back? So I'm in my circle of lights, as Stanislavski calls them. There's no audience anymore. There's the fourth wall that's become a circular wall now or circle of light. I'm only focusing on what's happening with me in my circle. What am I trying to do? Maybe going about this conversation is to take on a different tactic because the one that I've been trying to do is not working. You're still not giving importance. You're not paying respect to the fact that that object means to me something. So I'm here and I'm allowing my frustration out. And all of a sudden you look at the other actor, the other actor, because he knows that I have this monologue, is no longer paying attention to me. And then I decide that I want to get up on the table I want to get up on the table to say, attention must be paid to what I say. That's one of the lines, the famous lines from Death of a Salesman. Attention must be paid to what I say. It is important what I say. And I get up on top of the table. And the other actor doesn't react. If you see another person getting up on a table in real life, are you not going to go and try to make sure that the person 
that you still love just because you had a disagreement about the subject, you still care about that person. You don't want the person to fall off of the table, right? You don't. So what would be the instinctual way to go about it? But because they're thinking from the actor's perspective, oh, I know that the other actor at one point is going to get up on the table. So they're anticipating rather than know that you know the lines, but then you have to let them go and imagine that you don't. Imagine the lines and the situation is happening as if it's happening for the first time. And that's the hardest thing to do. So the other actor who was there leaving me alone to do my little monologue on stage while he's doing something else, still has to be aware of what the other person is doing because if I make such a big gesture and I stand up on my both feet and I knock on the table before I do it and I stand on the table and I go attention must be paid and he's not looking at me he's not coming to protect me to say don't fall off of the table maybe it's too weak and it's gonna make you hurt yourself Come down. So with his next line, it doesn't matter if the line is, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Because the subtext is, come down off the table. Let's have a civilized conversation. No, he's still there. And he goes, let's have a civilized conversation. As if me getting up on the table was not even noticed. You cannot not notice what is happening at all times when you are on stage, because then that will keep you just as an actor. You will never transfer from the actor to merge with the character. You will never become a character. You will always be an actor acting. And the characters are not actors. The characters are people, unless specified that you're playing a character who's an actor, but we're not talking about that. So that back and forth, that observation, the observer part of you, you paying attention to what is happening with the other person, to the small details and trying to be there for them or acknowledging them and then say, you know what, I'm not going to be there for you. You can make that choice. She got up. I see she's going to fall. I want to go help, but you know what? I'm making a choice. You know what? I'm not doing this. Fall if you want to fall. Let's talk about this. And I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to see you doing these crazy things. There are choices that you can make about it. It's not just one choice, but you have to make a choice in relation to what you are seeing, in relation to what you are hearing, in relation to what you are touching, in relation to what you are smelling, in relation to what is happening specifically, specific. If it's not specific, if it's not detailed, the way that you are on stage or on set, it remains a general acting, which equals bad acting. Great acting requires specificity, details, and moment-to-moment -moment work. Pay attention, paying specific attention. Maybe the next evening when you're doing the show, there's something slightly different that the actor is giving you. And that is such a wonderful thing because it's going to make you feel like every night is the first night when you're performing. So it's not the sameness of doing the performance in a general way and then you become bored with that. It will keep you alive. You have to stay alive. You have to stay ready with your instrument, with your senses open to respond to the slightest changes, to the slightest imaginary things that you have because that's the power of acting you have the power that is so much more than even reality because you're given the opportunity within this circumstances of the script of the play to imagine to reimagine to live to relive to find solutions to conflicts from your personal life and bring those people from your personal lives that you cannot finish the conflict or you cannot say, I love you too. And you can substitute, you can put the faces of those people in your life on the actor or on the imaginary person that you're speaking with. You can endow the imaginary object with somebody that you want to just erase from your life for the painting. There's so many opportunities to be creative. And everything is allowed for as long as you give yourself permission to try different ways and different tactics. Don't just assume the monologue is a monologue and it's either sad or angry or happy or joyful. Where does that leave you? 
that doesn't leave you any kind of room to be able to create, to call yourself a creator. And you're not going to have fun. And the ultimate goal is to have fun because if you're going to have fun, the audience is going to have fun. If you're going to have fun and if you're going to believe, the audience is going to do that. Don't pretend. In life, nothing is just straight. Nothing is just linear. Nothing is just one way. Because that's not the way that we work as people. There's so much going on in our brain. There's so much going on in our heart and souls and our bodies. Release all of it. Figure it out as you go along. Don't know for sure this is how it's going to be. Because if you know for sure this is how it's going to be, what's the difference between an artist and somebody on the street whom you can give a text and say, memorize the monologue? Anybody can memorize monologue and say it, sad. Anybody can be angry and say a monologue angry. That's not artistry. So never, ever consider monologues to be monologues. You're always speaking to someone, to something. It can be you're speaking to God, even if the character is not speaking to God, even if he doesn't tell you in the script who the character is speaking with. You have to find for yourself who you are speaking with. But you can only do that by putting in practice and giving yourself the trying of what it could be. Let's find out. Like a detective, you have to go through the script and you have to find what are the clues in between the lines. Go deeper underneath the words in between and figure it out the only way that you can figure it out. Because why do you think people go to see the same plays or they see movies who were remade with other actors? They go to see other actors in the same characters because it's what the actors bring to those characters due to their life, to their backstory, to their experiences, to their people where they come from, to their culture. That's what it is. That's why they keep seeing the same characters because you bring your interpretation to that character. But your interpretation, not with the one personality that you feel comfortable with or with the one version of who you are or two versions, because there's thousands of them inside. So you have to work your instrument, tap into them to be able to bring them to light and rearrange them depending on what the character is asking of you. The character circumstances are asking of you. So somebody, after the first night, after seeing her show, we came out, there was a person and the person said, so what did you think of the show? And I said, it was not credible. I didn't believe any of the moments. I thought it was very manufactured emotions. I felt that they were not behaving on stage as humans. And he looks at me, he goes, how dare you say that? You don't understand the culture. You don't understand the traditions. And he wasn't even somebody from Egypt because he would have been different. But the Egyptian people never said that because they're so open to learning all of these things that I'm talking about. But it was somebody who was not even Egyptian. I've been here. Do you know how many times I've been here in this country? And how can you say you did not believe? I don't even understand what that is. Sir, if you don't understand what I'm saying, which is very clear, I did not believe those characters to be characters. I believe them to be actors on stage when the characters are not actors. They're not behaving as human beings. What are you talking about? Do you know how many plays I've seen in my life? How dare you tell me that you... When somebody cannot even have a conversation to express their different opinions, that's when something is really wrong. Because for the remaining of my stay there, he was ignoring me completely. I did not want to have anything to do with that person, nothing personal to him, but I just realized that he knows nothing about acting. Doesn't matter that you teach theater, that you are an academic theorist about theater, that doesn't make you an expert in the art of experiencing, which is what Ilya Kazan calls the definition of acting to be. It's the art of experiencing. It is psychology transformed into behavior. If you don't believe the behavior of those people on the stage, they remain actors for the audience. That is bad acting. He couldn't even comprehend what I was saying. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind. But majority of the people out there don't get it. They don't get it. But the ones that do like these fabulous artists that I had the opportunity and the privilege to work with. That's all I need. That's all I need to know that there's this generation everywhere in the world who's going to carry on and who's going to want to do justice to what great acting is because great acting is a powerful, powerful thing. So to not put yourself in a situation to give it all, to spend you 
all in it and remain an actor doing general gestures and doing general behavior, it's not okay with me. It's so funny because there was a great moment with someone else, but it was so funny because there was, you know, a little bit of miscommunication due to all of us speaking different languages, myself having Romanian and my first and English and second. And I was speaking to this one person and after watching one of the shows that I really enjoyed was the show from Oman, which I thought was the closest to the closest to what I described acting to be. And it just moved me so much that I was very expressive in the way that I was demonstrating what I felt and I was thanking them because it happened after I had the conversation with the other gentleman who was like I don't understand oh leave me alone I don't know what you're talking about so it was such a welcoming gift to have those actors and the director and the team from Oman to see that they have the understanding how to approach the work which was the closest that it came to what I believe the acting work should be. So I was very enthusiastic and I was talking about it and I was animated the way that I'm animated, which sometimes I have to kind of take back, but it's hard for me too. I still have to work on that. So I was talking to them and it was such a wonderful moment. One of the uh, most kind and generous people there who actually made my whole stay be so much better because he was just so kind and generous. I mean, majority of them were, but this, particular person was very kind he says after he's observing me he says you are very you are very so I'm there you know my ego is getting bigger and I hear people say good things about you and after the workshop so I guess people were hearing about the workshop and how the students were appreciative of learning this new approach on top of their training because there's nothing wrong with the way that they're being trained it's just that they were so open to getting everything from what I had to offer and he was saying you know they're talking very they're saying very good things I'm like well nobody's talking to me because I was referring to people just walking away from me because I'm speaking my belief in what I think acting great acting should be and he says and you are very how do you say so he takes out his phone and he's trying to look for the definition to find the word in um, English You are very, oh, he's going to say that I'm passionate. He's going to say I'm brilliant. He's going to say that I'm extraordinary. All of the things that we want to hear, you know. So I'm waiting and I'm thinking there. He's going to say one of those words. I'm passionate. I'm this. He says you are very, oh, yes, yes. You are very narcissistic. (laughs) You are a narcissist. I kind of went back like this on the chair and I said, are you sure? Because you're probably looking at the wrong definition or the word is not correct. So he says, okay, let me see. No, you are very narcissist. Oh my God, that was so funny. That was so funny. And that just gives you another insight into a moment. If I were to recreate this moment, if this moment was written in a play, for example, or if this was in a script, the obvious tendency for us, if I were the actor playing myself and he was the actor playing himself, and we were to play this moment where this is a conversation going on, the obvious way that we would say this scene should play out is like, oh, you are very, 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 and then he calls me narcissistic. I would be like, How dare you call me narcissistic? How dare? Because narcissistic is not a flattering description of someone. But it made me laugh so hard. And it made me feel so joyful in that moment because somebody was not afraid to say what they really thought. And I appreciate that. I can't just preach acting to be truthful. And then in everyday life, if somebody says something about me that I don't agree with, In this case, I do agree that I'm a narcissist. Still makes me laugh. It still brings laughter. So now because I had experienced that with somebody who was unafraid, unapologetic, this is what he saw in me. And he said it. And I appreciated so much the honesty, 
rather than put on a face and pretend that we're not going to say that because it might sound that it's offensive to me. He said it and it made me laugh and I couldn't stop laughing. And even when I shared the story with students here, because I wanted to finish with that, the directing actors class here is so extraordinary at SVA because these young filmmakers are putting themselves in the shoes of actors to better understand all these detailed tools that I've been speaking about to how to guide, to learn how to guide the actors in the process of getting their script achieved to what they visually have in their minds as the bigger picture. It's not enough that you have a big picture of what you want the film to be if you don't know how to guide those actors to get out of them what you want without saying this monologue is sad this monologue is angry 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 can mean different things to different people you have to be exploring with them so the narcissistic moment if i were to play it i would take that from my personal life and i would say i'm not going to be upset why would i be upset i would interpret it Differently than the obvious, which somebody probably at first read of it would say, how dare you offend me? It's a bad thing. I'm turning my back. I'm walking. No, I stayed and I laughed for 10 minutes and I'm still laughing when I think about it because somebody has the courage to be truthful in what their belief is, in how they see me in a short time that I was there. This was exciting. I am so glad I was able to do this because I was ready to give this up. Because you have moments where, you know, you think, oh, my God, I have nothing to say or I've said everything. But I was so enthusiastic and those artists and Egypt given me so much. I was so excited to just recall some of the acting we've done and to recognize that all of us as actors must keep on asking the same questions of ourselves, of the characters, of the script, and give ourselves the chance to know what the objective is. At first, how do I achieve it? There's not just one way of going about it. There's thousands of ways, millions of ways. The observer part of you has to be there. The heightened instrument that's ready all the time to respond to images, to respond to people, to respond to imaginary people. It's just so much. Thank you to the artist of Cairo. Thank you so much to all the beautiful people and especially the beautiful artists from the workshop in Cairo, Egypt. You have given me so much energy to keep me going for a long time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Kisses. Always remember, a monologue is never a monologue for an actor. It is always a scene. Monologues are scenes. Thank you for listening. Hey Stella Podcast, episode 60. Ha ha ha. Thank you. Mwah, mwah, mwah.